Um, this past summer, I was hiking deep in the Ladakhi backcountry with support from a Ladakhi guide, a Nepali cook, a Tibetan horseman, and my best friend's 15-year-old son. The young man asked me why the rocks in the mountain range where we were walking are such vibrant shades of green, red, and purple, and I replied that they contain minerals like iron and copper, which is about the limit of my mineral knowledge. <laughs> and he then said, with a nostalgia and a cynicism beyond his years, it's too bad they'll destroy this place with mining one day. And Jigmet, our guide, jumped in. I've known Jigmet for five years, since he was little more than a teenager himself. He alternates between a robust sense of humor and some pretty profound dharma. He's fluent in four or five languages and was sent to Bangalore in central India as a child to study at boarding school run by Theravada monks. He has a degree in communications and does occasional office work, but mostly he works as a guide in the summer, making most of the money for the year, uh, and then hanging out with his family in his village during the winter. Jigmet explained to my young friend that there is no mining in most of Ladakh, and that he doesn't think there ever will be. While there are, he said, greedy people in Ladakh, as there are greedy people everywhere, mining is considered an unacceptable and unsustainable way to avoid the land. And then he said this amazing thing. He said, and anyway, it offends the sensibilities of the mountain gods. So this story is characteristic of a part of the world that survives economically by, by allowing outsiders to visit while holding relatively fast to the cultural, spiritual, and ecological values that have kept its identity strong for centuries, protected partly by a challenging climate that means visitors only come during certain parts of the year, Ladakhis have maintained their linguistic and cultural identity against overwhelming odds. While climate change is bringing new challenges to the region, it remains a model of sustainability and cultural integrity sandwiched between the world's newest megapowers, India and China. For many outside of the Himalayan region, and in this country in particular, if they have heard about Ladakh at all, they have heard about it because of Helen Norbert Raj. Her 1988 book, Ancient Futures, translated in 1991 into English, on what we can all learn about outer and inner development from the people of Ladakh, has a foreword by the Dalai Lama and an introduction from Peter Matheson. When I first arrived in Ladakh five years ago, I heard Helena's name everywhere I went, most notably because she was, or so I was told, and I believe this to be true, the first Westerner to achieve real fluency in the Ladakhi language. Ladakhi language is related to uh, modern Tibetan as Middle English is related to the language that we speak. So it would be basically like going somewhere where everyone was speaking the language of the Canterbury Tales. <laughs> <laughs> this facility with languages is no accident. Born in Sweden, she was raised in and studied all over the world, including studying linguistics with Noam Chomsky at MIT. She is fluent in seven languages and truly interdisciplinary in her approach to the major problems facing the non-dominant cultures of the world today. She is an author, a filmmaker, an ecologist, an activist, an advocate, and a visionary. She is known the world over as a critic of globalization and a proponent of localization, both as an economic strategy and as an approach to maintaining the enormous and beautiful variability of cultures languages, ecosystems, and worldviews that exist. I think of her work as a kind of crusade against cultural extinction. Mm. Helena has expanded her approach in Ancient Futures to found Local Futures, a nonprofit organization, quote, dedicated to the revitalization of cultural and biological diversity and the strengthening of local communities and economies worldwide. For one of her projects, the Ladakh Ecological Development Group, she won a Right Livelihood Award, as you've heard, in 1986. More recently, her work as a pioneer of the New Economy Movement earned her the 2012 Goey Peace Prize. Through writing and public lectures on three continents, she has been promoting an economics of personal, social, and eco ecological well-being for more than 30 years. She is a widely respected analyst of the impact of the global economy on communities, local economies, and personal identity, and looks to decentralization as a means of countering those impacts. She is the founder and director of the International Society for Ecology and Culture, and a founding member of the International Commission on the Future of Food and Agriculture, and a co-founder of both the International Forum on Globalization and the Global Eco-Village 
network. In his introduction to ancient futures, His Holiness the Dalai Lama praises Helena for reminding us of the value of inner development alongside its more valorized external analog. Her most recent work takes the notion of inner development to its logical conclusion, arguing for a new old economics of happiness about which she will speak tonight. Please join me in welcoming Helena and Robert. Where many people 
believe that Scandinavia has got it right. Uh, so there's a lot to talk about, and I'll be talking in these sweeping generalizations because I'm talking about a system which is a generalization. It's an embodiment of, of a generalization. It's a top-down monoculture. And we and I think it's really important that we see it from that bigger picture and that we see it from the bottom up. My great frustration is that most people who have a global perspective tend to come from the power elites in government or in big business. And so much of the activism that is about protecting a particular forest, a particular culture, a particular river, a particular language is coming from a more local perspective. And because of that local perspective, the understanding of the big system is often too limited. And so I, I hope I don't sound arrogant or anything, but I'm speaking from, as I say, you know, 40 years of interaction with many different cultures. And so the general sweeping generalizations I'm making have a validity. We have to remember there's a universal problem here that we're talking about. And there is a universal solution. Because we're talking about two competing systems. We're talking about a techno-economic system artificially created out of force, and we're talking about the universality of the living Mother Gaia that is the real economy, and that is our cultural birthplace. And because Mother Gaia is diversity, and diversity to the point where each and every cell, each and every leaf, each and everything that lives is unique and constantly changing. So the process and the complexity of the living world is, is a universal reality. And so therefore, there is a universal need to adapt to that diversity. And there, so there are lessons that are certainly valid across these cultures about the need for deep um, adaptation. And that's really what, what I mean by the session. So really what, what I developed over the last decade or so is the term, the economics of happiness. And I want to just stress that we're of course not talking about the la la happy consumer culture. A lot of people reject the term happiness because it's been trivialized. And I've had really for almost 40 years, I've had that battle with people, especially in the West, who sort of felt, well, Happiness. You can't measure it. What you know? How can you even talk about it? And what I always used to say is, all of us know what it's like to feel happy and what it's like to feel unhappy. We know it's real. We know that there is a reality there, whether it can be quantified or not. And another term for what we're trying to talk about really is the economics of human and ecological well-being. That's, that needs to be the goal as far as we're concerned and that's what we're trying to promote and we're seeing that fundamentally this well-being is about the reconnection, the deep reconnection to nature and to others. And everywhere in the world you can see a longing for this, you can see a manifestation of it. And it gives us, in local futures, such joy to be in touch with literally millions of initiatives and people who are reconnecting. It's what I also call ancient futures, is that coming back home to those connections. And as I said before, localization is the economic path to this. Now, that... It, it's very important that we understand the difference between the economic part of localization versus the political decentralization or localization. It's worrying that many groups, including the Ladakhis, believe that if they can become politically independent, that they will be independent. But if we don't see the power of the global economic system, then we're very vulnerable if we're not looking at how we decentralize economically, and, and really we would be more strategic 
to start the process of economic globalization before we attempt to attain political independence. Now, I think that's true also for native people who are fighting to get their land rights back. It's true for Scotland and the UK, Catalonia and Spain. I, I believe, I mean, I have strong arguments to make this case. Um, and it can sound so simplistic and so general, but honestly, we have a wealth of material to show you how localization is a magical solution multiplier. Economic localization. And part, in order to see that clearly, we need that big picture. We need to be looking from that more global perspective to really see how the dominant system has encouraged a fragmented individualist view. It encourages deep self-blame, self-rejection, self-guilt, which in turn, of course, breeds uh, intolerance, anger, and hatred of the other. So we need to move beyond that self-blame to connect with the global grassroots, to get that global perspective, but from the bottom up, from a perspective that is you know, in the human and ecological realities, rather than what we're getting through the mainstream media. We need to reject the mainstream narrative completely. We, we're told that all of these problems we face are separate and somehow arising in and of themselves. Particularly, we see constant blame of the other, a divisive mainstream narrative that, uh, and we're not only talking about these forms of, of symptoms, but also climate change, extinction of species, all of these are viewed as separate. The wonderful thing about the global perspective is that we can see how things are connected. And it's a relief to start focusing on the economic transition rather than climate change, poverty, violence as separate issues. But the, the dominant narrative is also constantly blaming innate human greed. I have far too many friends and colleagues who now, unfortunately, are sort of saying, I give up, I give up on the human race. We, we really deserve to extinguish ourselves. Very, very sad to see that. And, and wrong, absolutely wrong. I'm going to grab my chair and put my feet on it. Okay. Nobody can see this one.
and think about the economic consequences. Think about how we now have five men owning more than half the global population. And please be willing to look at how technology is part of that. And what kinds of technologies would serve genuine justice, genuine ecological sustainability. This is not about technology or no technology. Even birds use technology. You know, it's not, we've used them for hours. So it's a question of what kind of technologies. And how can we create systems where there is enough overview, enough accountability, visibility, and technologies that operate at a human and ecological pace, as well as allowing for a different scale. It could be done, but it's going to require a massive um, understanding, I believe, of the system right now that's dominating us. So the understanding, at, as, as we see it, and, and it's, it's, it's simply true, is that we have a de facto government of interlinked banks and corporations. <coughs> Keep in mind that the banks have been freed up to create this make-believe money in larger and larger quantities. So we're talking about this huge empire that we are not allowed to talk about. We do not talk about it enough. There is a fear about questioning it. I personally am convinced that this is not about good guys and bad guys. This is not a few men in a dark room who are all evil and, you know, let's shoot them all and everything will be fine. This is about bad structures and good structures, not about bad people and good people. You know, the people who work in Monsanto are not that different from people who will be working in the corner shop. It's about structures, and, and uh, the, um, the problem is that we have not been aware of how that empire, that interlinked government, has been pressuring down on every government, pushing in the same direction. Enormous foreign investment, debt creation, enormous pressures towards monoculture. A consumer monoculture is being pushed in in every culture, and at the same time, biological monocultures, fishery, farming, forestry. Because this scale and this speed can't deal with diversity. It's structurally not capable of dealing with diversity. <coughs> and so this is fundamentally why it's anti-life. However, <coughs> I take heart in the millions, and I mean millions upon millions of projects, initiatives in the opposite direction. And many of them are translating into movements. I'm sure that you've all heard about the permaculture movement. <coughs> have you heard, you won't have heard probably, about the rural reconstruction movement in China? How many of you have heard of RIM in China? This is, a, this is a movement that means that for the first time this last year, apparently the urbanizing rate had been reversed, so that there has been more of a trend back to the smaller towns and villages for the first time. I was told this yesterday, and I almost, I have a hard time believing it, because in having visited China over the last decades, it's hard to believe that this is happening, but the professor who started the rural reconstruction movement is a very interesting man whom I know, Professor Wen from Beijing University. And it is a relatively small movement, but it is having a, an effect. Via Campesina, how many of you have heard of Via Campesina? So few of you, and this is really, a, this is in a way, I, I hope that you see this as good news. The good news is that you have not been hearing enough about m many of the positive, meaningful movements that are happening out there. Via Campesina is actually the biggest social movement in the world. And most people have not heard about it because it's about 300 million small farmers from Norway to Japan to South America. It started in South America, in the US as well, in the UK. 
there are members. These small farmers understood way ahead of the urban populations that the trade treaties were absolute disaster for diversified production, for healthy soils, for genuine productivity. They warned about this and they've been battling for what they call food sovereignty. Food sovereignty meaning we need to have the right to produce for our own people first and trade where it makes sense. This is a key element. I mean, I would say that you know, our biggest enemies are blindness, and another huge structural enemy is the idea that we need monoculture for export, specialized for export, rather than diversify for local needs. That formula was brought in at the same time, basically, as slavery and colonialism. The Transition Town Network, I mean, I'm sure you know about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I still want to mention you. And um, so, and you're seeing, and the system change movement here in America is some very enlightened economists who are realizing we need to look at a new economic system. We need to create a movement around that shift. And new economy movements are growing around the world. Um, well, there's, I'm taking too long. This is a movement which is very controversial. But I think that the way that they built up a people's movement is a very interesting and very important, very positive and inspiring example. The man on the left is Beppe Grillo. He's an Italian comedian. And in 2006, he said to the people of Italy, he was a love comedian, he had done skits on banking, on the whole banking system and so on. And he said, there's no point voting. You know, left or right, big government is in bed with big business. It's corrupt. It's structurally corrupt. We just have to have a people's movement to completely transform politics, to represent people, and to have a participatory democracy. In six years, by setting up local groups across the country and using the internet instead of the media, they built up a movement that went into parliament after only six years and had 29% of the vote, basically put an end to Berlusconi, Italy's Trump. The most amazing thing, what gives me such hope, is that every single day for the last six years, they are under attack in Italy. And that is what shows me what a threat they are to this de facto corporate government. Every single day they're attacked for being right wing, mainly they're attacked for being right wing, but left wing, populist, um, fascist, um, too hierarchical. But the truth is that the mayor of Rome, this woman here, a 38-year-old lawyer, she told the Olympics, sorry, we don't want you, go away. We are paying off debt since the 1960s for the previous Olympics. Go away, we don't want you. Now that tells me more than anything that they're on the right track. It also tells me they're on the right track because they've been using our film regularly. And I had the opportunity to speak at an event like this just a, uh, about a month ago to about 20,000 people. And a really encouraging thing is that despite the attacks every day in the corporate media, they're not getting rid of them. Their popularity has actually gone up by one or two percent. So they're sitting there, they're using a participatory process. It's very difficult. They're trying to really involve the citizens in planning and budgeting. They're not in control of the government, but they are able to do certain things like this. So it's a very exciting example. Um, and it shows me that if we build up the numbers, at a certain point, the corporate media, however much they attack you, they can't get rid of you. Please also keep in mind that almost no one outside Italy has heard about this amazing people's movement. And it's because there's such a threat to, to the public system. Now, we, we, this is how we 
explain the basic, the absolutely basic plans that we have to look at, how we have to transform the economy. Our colleagues in Italy, and we work in South Korea with a network of mayors, including the mayor of Seoul. Um, in Japan, we built up a very big localization movement. And not everybody has the same analysis of how best to transform it. But our experience is that by looking at regulations, subsidies, and taxes, and shifting them in, in the support of place-based businesses within ecological limits, that is how we can and must transform the economy. The regulations at the moment, the regulations, the taxes, the subsidies, all support big business to the detriment of small business. All of us individuals, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, national businesses are being squeezed for taxes. And those taxes turn around and essentially subsidize monopolies, global monopolies, who through deregulation have the freedom to move wherever they like. And that's how they end up blackmailing our governments. Um, so this is, it's rather simple and it's not, it does not require, we're not going to shoot, you know, everyone who works in Goldman Sachs or put them in jail or close down Monsanto overnight. We can, with civic society at the side, start regulating them and taxing them. But it will require international collaboration, and it requires an educated public, an educated civic society. The most dark secret of all has been these trade treaties. And don't think for a minute that either Hillary or Trump are going to be dealing with these in a meaningful way. I think Bernie Sanders might have tried to, but here, these trade treaties are absolutely, unbelievably anti-democratic. <coughs> in Sweden in the 70s, about 70% 70 of us said no to nuclear power. The government told us, OK, well, we'll gradually reduce our dependence on nuclear power. Now, the dependence has increased dramatically. And here we have a Swedish nuclear power company called Vattenfall, which means waterfall, is suing Germany for 3.7 billion euros because Germany decided to phase out nuclear power after Fukushima. This has been going on with these trade treaties. Under Clinton, it was, you know, he made a huge push in this direction. I am convinced that many of our leaders seriously do not understand what's happening. And it's because we haven't done our job of looking at this globally enough and putting it out clearly and forced that truth out in a holistic way. So it's easy, for instance, for Sweden to bring in a law two years ago to say that trade treaties have to be negotiated in secrecy. The few journalists who contacted me and said, can you please help make, you know, some little cheap Skype video. I haven't even been in touch with them, you know, in the last few years. I don't know if, you know, certainly didn't have an impact. There were just a few journalists who were saying, how can everybody be keeping quiet about this? The mentality on the other side will be something like, oh, Volvo has to keep its trade secret, so of course we as a country are going to support it. It's a real lack of understanding of the structural problem of allowing global corporations to have more power than national governments. Allowing the banks to say to Obama after 2008, if you try to regulate us, we're going elsewhere. The going elsewhere is what has to stop. That's what localization means for us at a structural level, that every business has to be registered in a country adhere to the rules of that country. And the beautiful thing about this is that we do not need a communist or even socialist model of government owning and in a top-down bureaucratic way running this thing. It's about rules. It's about rules, it's about taxes and subsidies. 
to continue with a system based on jobless growth. To continue with a system where we subsidize business to use more energy and technology while we talk about climate change and unemployment. That's what we have. We have to step back and look at this big picture to see clearly how absolutely crazy it is. And we have to see the link between not only the epidemic of fear and anxiety in youth, the suicide rate in young people now. If you want to see the future for the US, go and get a job in Korea or, or Japan. Become a university student in Korea. I mean, the pressure is just unbelievable. There, people worry about taking one week's holiday for fear of losing their job and losing pay. Why? Why? How did we end up like this? Subconsciously, I think many people accept this because they believe at a subconscious level that it's to do with, with overpopulation. This pressure and the unemployment has nothing whatsoever to do with, with overpopulation. Nothing, 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 nothing. On this crowded planet, we need many more people to ensure that the teaching in farming, in healthcare, in every, every arena, that there are more people, that we reduce the ratio of professor to teacher, doctor to patient, nurse to patient, counselor to patient. Absolutely nothing to do with overpopulation. All to do with a blind uh, idea about progress and foreign investment. And of course we know, I mean we sort of know about the war machine, we know the budget of the US. Did you also know, I just heard the other day from Jerry Mander, that there are 475 US army bases in the Pacific. And we hear in this great anger about the Chinese, they have five. They have five army bases and the US has 475 in the Pacific. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, now what's very frightening is that because of these last three decades of globalization, where banks and corporations could move to where labor is cheaper, the wealth and the power of these corporations has grown geometrically. Now many of them are coming home. GE has come back to America to produce washing machines here, apparently more cheaply than in China using robots. Now, again, you know, there may be a role for robots in some <coughs> aspect, but we are not, we need to really wake up to what's happening there in terms of all of those fields I was talking about, teaching, health, <coughs> areas of absolutely vital importance being colonized by robots. The finance industry essentially is run by algorithms. It means robots are determining the value of our currency. The va that means the value of our seeds, the value of our water, the value of our democracy. So we need a movement where we just laugh this system out of the room. <laughs> it is so crazy. It is so stupid. I mean, I've often said before to you, if it were a person, the economic system, we would have locked it up a long time ago, you know, never to let it out again. Understanding that it's mad and dangerous as a system. I, you know, my eyes are open to this because of Ladakh, and I, the, you know, these these are scenes from Ladakh that you can actually still. This is from Ladakh today. When I first came, all of those women were wearing the most exquisitely beautiful clothes. Now they look a little bit like paupers, but they still have some of the radiance that they had back then. I was amazed by the wealth. This is, you know, just this is normal, an average house. And above all, just so amazed by this radiant joy that was, um, yeah, that made me fall in love uh, and made me stay. And I actually won't go into too much about the Ladakh story now because I'm. My main motivation in doing this here is to try to catalyze movement for change in America. I do hope that if you're interested that you'll read my book, Ancient Futures. I feel that what I'm offering is a view of 
everyday indigeneity, not just that special day that was the rites of passage or a shamanistic ritual or um, you know some isolated aspect, but I lived with these people, I spoke the language fluently, and I saw from the inside the incredible joy and equanimity that comes from deep community relationships, intergenerational community. Every mother had about eight or ten living caretakers for every baby. That is a wealth, a gift that we can't even begin to imagine what it means. We can't begin to imagine what it means in terms of empowering women and the feminine. Um, the gift also to men was that from the age of five, they would be carrying their sibling. They developed their nurturing, caring side. It was in no way considered uncool <laughs> as a 13 or 15 year old boy to be cooing over a baby. Within a decade, I saw how the role models for young boys and young girls became literally Rambo and Barbie doll. And the worst of it is that, you know, what I saw very graphically there is that the images from the consumer culture that came through schooling, media, tourism, a type of colonial also behavior on part of the, the Indian, all of these messages for the children were, if you want to be somebody, if you want to have the love and acceptance the deep sense of self-respect. Um, you need to have the latest running shoes, you need to have the iPad, you need to look like Barbie or, or Rambo. And I saw how basically a universal, truly universal human need to be loved and accepted, respected, heard, seen, that universal need to be loved was perverted to a need to consume. And now we have this, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy where we hear, you know, we're born greedy, we're just greedy by, by this, this part of being human. So, what's so amazing to me is to see, even in modern Ladakh now, but around the world, that we can regain that sense of self-esteem. We can regain that sense of being really human by connecting deeply. The deeper connections that people, uh, some people call it sitting in council, it's, it's about moving beyond this idea of being perfect and looking the right role and having the PhD or having the fancy car or having this, having that. Connecting heart to heart, deeply being able to be vulnerable and truthful about who we are, how we feel. We are seeing the most amazing results when people are helped to do that, particularly at the same time connecting to nature. So we know so many projects where prisoners have been helped to garden and to have that deeper conversation of how they got into prison, what happened. We've seen juvenile delinquents, literally some juveniles who have only been angry their whole lives. The deeper connection and connection to nature can turn people around literally in a week. And it's, it's probably more than that, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. So anyway, the end, the sort of conclusion from seeing huge changes in Ladakh and seeing changes the other way led to this conviction and, um, you yeah, know, that we need this systemic shift away from the global jobs <coughs> to more place-based businesses. And we believe that right now the most important thing we can do is what we call big picture activism. It's about getting a different view of progress, a different view of humanity and a bigger picture understanding of where this economic system, this well-funded narrative, this well-funded story about who we are, that we're really aggressive, and that this system we have is somehow evolutionary. We can't change it. 
It's remarkable how passive people are in the face, basically, of man-made policies, man-made technologies. And I know, um, yeah, I know it can seem ridiculous to think that we can change the business system. Just think about how Bernie Sanders, how much support he got. People want systemic change. People are ready for change. And now, more than ever, I think we could do it. But we really need, I believe, to have that bigger picture, to be clear about not just what we don't want, but what we do want. And, and be clear about that systemic change. We call eco-literacy both economic literacy linked to ecological literacy. And we believe that, as I said before, it's vital that we put livelihoods at the front. Livelihoods number one, and then a whole raft of, of other issues linked to the economy. But the same systemic shift that will provide secure livelihoods is the same economic shift that will reduce energy consumption, that will reduce the gap, that will increase biodiversity, that will increase uh, through a, a shrinking the gap, greater empowerment and democracy. So we said, I, you know, as I said before, connection is fundamental. We try to lead people, we do workshops and we lead people with these five words of connect, oh, now here, yeah, educate, resist, <coughs> renew. Uh, to the next one later. But the connection and the changing the I to a we is fundamental. People have been herded into thinking of themselves as individual consumers. We've been pushed away from thinking of community collective action and policy action. If we think we're going to change the world through our shopping habits, it means that poor people have virtually no vote and rich people have all the votes. If we believe in democracy, let's look at how we can collectively change the policy. I, we say, I've mentioned before about this, um, the amazing results, and, and there are now, there is so much evidence. You know, people who suffer from depression, going for a walk in the shopping mall usually increases the depression, going for a walk in nature, <laughs> A large number of people feel better. There's just it's it's who we are. It's in our DNA. We're connected to nature. We have evolved in intergenerational communities. We're connected to each other. The most important, the central aspect of the localization movement that is giving so much healing and joy to people, and that grows day by day is the global local food movement, the global local food movement. It is particularly strong in the industrialized countries. It was really wonderful, and we feel very privileged to play a role bridging between the North and South, or between the so-called Third World and First World. And so these local food initiatives are increasing every day, and you need to know that it's very rare that any of these initiatives have been undertaken and closed down. Because it's very rare. The norm is that they go from strength to strength. And they, yeah, I, I probably don't need to tell you so much about it, except to keep in mind that even if you have lots in Santa Cruz, you're probably talking about a maximum of 10% of the food. And it needs to be reversed so that you're talking about more like 80%. And remember, local is not absolute. We mustn't be fundamentalists, we mustn't be purists, but let's start the movement, the process. And, and, it's, yeah, and above all, not just through our shopping, but by supporting the organizations that are building the bridges and creating a new structure, in the co-op of the future, the cooperation between production and consumption. And by the way, not eliminating the middlemen either, but it's middlemen of a scale that respect diversity, that can understand and work with diversity. And, uh, and their, their, their experience in the farmers' markets, uh, yeah, I don't need to say too much about it, but I hope you realize it. But I do need to say something more about this, because I do not hear enough about this that the shorter distance between market and the farm 
stimulates, it enforces diversity, the longer distances impose monoculture, one crop, and not just one crop, but the pressure in the bigger and bigger and more distant market is that each apple, each potato should be the same size. The machinery, the harvesting machine, you know, that stupidly will pick apples when only half of them are ripe and only half of them the right size for the machinery that washes and puts it on the supermarket shelf. So we burn and dump tons of food that doesn't fit in this monoculture. So the, the fact is that you will never, ever be able to provide an example of two bits of land and you put monoculture on one and diversity on the other. You'll never be able to produce more with monoculture. You will always be able to increase productivity, and the amazing thing is with it, greater soil fertility, carbon sinking. I mean, the, the benefits, this is why localization is so fundamental. It comes back to the real economy, the earth. And we're talking about fisheries as well. We're talking about the seas. We're talking about forests. A friend of mine is an architect, and he's just telling me now in England, they're clear-cutting oak forests because the market can't deal with diversity, so trees this big are being clear-cut as firewood. Mm. So he's rescuing some of those larger trees and turning them into timber for buildings and so on. But that's what's happening in this large-scale, distant, machine-based system. Unbelievable inefficiency and waste, and all the time contributing to climate change, contributing to unemployment, it's wonderful to see that more and more of these diversified farms are demonstrating not only greater productivity, but greater joy. Mm -hmm. Just think of the difference between standing as some migrant laborer or a slave back when in a cotton field, you know, all day picking one thing. Of course, when you have through colonialism and slavery created such an unjust system, mm -hmm. then a lot of people are relieved to be replaced by technology. But not here, not in these farms. Their technology is used as an aid, as a way of alleviating labor where it makes sense, but it's at a relaxed pace, it's at a, at a and, and it's a, well, it's, it's a joy. For me, this new farmers movement the small divorce farms that are accompanied by organization is the greatest hope for the future. From that is also springing business alliances. How many of you know about Judy Wicks? She's a friend of mine. She's just spoken. At, we just had four Economics of Happiness conferences in the U.S. And Judy was a great friend. She spoke at two of them. You've invited she, her here for years, but she hasn't made it yet. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I'm even more she's in Pennsylvania. She comes to our conferences regularly. But she does feel, uh, she, because we're presenting an international perspective also, she feels she learns a lot. And, but she, her story is that she had a restaurant in Philadelphia, and she started learning more about what was happening to the animals, to the land, and she started localizing and getting to know the farmers and getting a, a very different relationship and stimulating a different form of production. So she started a, lo a local initiative. And then she started something called Ballet, which is the business alliance for local living economies, to encourage other businesses to get together to be part of this localization movement, which among other things also educates the consumers which also uh, creates in those relationships, face-to-face -face relationships that reduce racism, fear, and anger. We're rebuilding interdependence, again, how we, how we evolve. When we're so distant from each other in this competitive system, the label becomes the thing that we relate to, not the living human being. Um, so, there, that is one, there's, there are other initiatives and what's emerging from the localization movement is, first of all, we don't have that much funding to do lots of research. It would be wonderful to have more help from some of you academics here, but certainly the research has shown what happens. 
when you show up from an independent local business, how the money circulates in the local economy and it benefits the community, benefits the local government, has more taxes for the local government, it benefits the local community. But all the time, um, the dominant finance system, of course, makes many of these initiatives very difficult. So local investment for localization is very important. And there are many creative ways of doing that. I do not recommend local currencies. A lot of people jump to local currencies. We started two about 20 years ago, one from our office in Berkeley and one in Vermont. They ran for 10 years but then folded. They are not working. Uh, I would really have to say it's amazing the difference between the local food initiatives and the local currency initiative. A friend of mine is the mayor of Bristol in the UK, and a couple of years ago when he was mayor, he launched a local currency. He paid himself entirely in the local currency. People can pay taxes in the local currency. It's still not working. So I'm warning people for the time being not to opt for that. But at our conference in Vermont uh, last week, they, uh, some people have set up an investment fund there. I don't know if it's possible here, but in Vermont, they are able, without any red tape, if they have less than $2 million and less than 200 people, I think it is, then they can just set up a fund, and, and, and a fund that they can then use to stimulate and invest in local uh, localization initiatives. So, you know, local energy, local food initiative, sometimes revolving loans. And so local energy is an important part of this movement, but I would say, I would urge everyone to make sure that you uh, contribute to the local food movement as a priority. Keep in mind that with climate change and with political instability, that the supermarkets, you know, we're very vulnerable. In three days, they'll be empty. So having a more diversified food economy in the region is vitally important. And the, for us, part of the whole localization movement is rebuilding a participatory, community-based culture. It's how we evolve. Again, Ladakh showed me the difference between the traditional way where everybody participated in singing, dancing, and making music. You didn't have to be perfect. People were multi-dimensional. They could sing, they could dance, they could make music, they could build houses, they could grow food, they could make clothing. And this becoming more multidimensional is a great joy, and particularly in celebrating life, and particularly with, with song and music. So this is, of course, why we call it the economics of happiness. And it's happening. It's happening as part of the globalization movement. You see how much it stimulates intergenerational community, greater in, uh, interdependence. But I want to add also that this needs to be uh, become the broader economy. It's not enough to just focus on building this in our local areas. We need to link up with others to transform the bigger system. And that's what we call you know, building an economics of happiness. Thank you.